physics notes, units, unit 10.1 to 10.5, part C. This is, this is rotational or angular kinematics. And these three problems I will be doing now are good examples. They're good review problems in the bigger picture for a lot of things we've done all year. So our good exam preparation questions. Here we have a hollow ball uh, that's rolling along, we're assuming it's rolling on a flat surface. Then it gets to a hill and rolls up a hill. So it's about slipping. And it says treat the ball as a spherical shell. Now that's a big clue. Whenever it talks about geometric configurations, it's inferring that table, that page, with all those different rotational inertia configurations. And I looked it up and the value for the moment of inertia for a thin shell, a spherical shell, it is two-thirds m, it's an m, two-thirds mr squared. So hopefully you're noticing now it's always something mr squared or ml squared, so it's a mass times a length squared. But that's, that you have to look up or be given. So what's interesting here is Wow, they don't give you the mass or the radius of this ball. Turns out it doesn't matter, but you'll see why maybe in a few minutes here. But they could have given you the mass and radius, and we could plug those in. So typically you would be plugging in there because they would give you the mass and the radius of this ball. All right, but this one, once again, with practice, you'll notice that this is a conservation of energy problem. This goes back a unit or two. Uh, it says... Part A, calculate the vertical height that it reaches. So bottom line is, all right, so we have a ball rolling along, and it's going to go up a hill. So it's rolling along, all right, and it's tangential velocity that's inferred when it says initial velocity, like the center of the ball is moving at 8.4. So the tangential velocity of a point on the rim of the ball, in particular, the center of the ball is moving to the right. That is, that is for sure. The center of the ball is moving to the right. That's not really spinning. The center of the ball is basically it's tracing out a straight line. It's going at a, at a, at a speed of 8.45 meters per second. And the ball is going to roll up the hill. And it's going to come to rest up here. The question is, basically, how high does that center of mass go? How high relative to where it was? How much higher does it go? So bottom line is, what is this height that the ball gets to relative to the ground, the flat ground it started on? And that those two arrows are supposed to be from the ground to the center of the ball, how high the center of the ball, how much higher it gets than it was before. That's what's inferred in this problem. So what's going to happen here is the ball at the end is going to have GPE. The general format, if you go back to conservation of energy, it's the energy initial plus energy input minus energy out, or lost, equals energy final. That's the comprehensive statement of the law of conservation of energy. So here's where we have to do our, our, our thinking, our conceptual thinking. What kind of initial energy does this ball have? Well, it actually has two types of initial energy. It's got the translational or linear kinetic energy. It's got Ke linear, Ke linear plus Ke rotational. It's spinning, that's energy, and it's also going in a straight line. That's linear energy. So it's got two types of energy to start with. Now, in this problem, we are going to ignore air resistance and all other frictional forces, although it does take friction with the ramp to get the ball to go up the ramp. We can ignore that for now. I'll come back to that. But uh, bottom line is there's no energy going to be put in. The ball is just rolling. Nobody's going to push it anymore. It was already launched. It could be like a bowling ball that was launched or thrown. It's going to roll up. And, and by the way, the interesting thing is if there were no friction, the ball would spin and it just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning and it goes up the ramp and we'd be spinning the whole time and when it gets to the top it'd be spinning. We'll talk about that in part B. 
if there's no friction. Part B says there's no friction whatsoever, but um, there has to be some friction for the ball to get a grip, so to speak, on the hill and then roll up the hill and come to a stop. More on that to come. Anyway, equals the final energy. The final energy is going to be GPE. Equals GPE, final energy. You don't need to know anything about that frictional stuff right now. It's, it's fairly straightforward. The ball starts with two types of energy, straight line linear kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. And all that energy is going to be lost. It's going to come to a stop. It's final energy. Well, not, it's not going to be moving. It's not going to be spinning. It's just GPE. So these are pretty straightforward calculations. In other words, it's going to be 1 half mv squared, the initial velocity squared, which we were given, plus 1 half i omega squared. That looks concerning. Equals m g h equals m g h so there's a lot of seems like we don't have enough information here however it's what's interesting about this problem is if we look at it more closely one half mv squared plus one half now i i already said i think originally oh here it is right here i for a a Spherical shell type of ball, not a solid ball. For a solid ball, what was it for a solid ball? Two, two, I can't remember what it was for a sol solid ball. Two-fifths? But for a shell, it's two-thirds. So I'm going to plug that in right now for my I value. It's two-thirds mr squared. So I'm going to plug in two-thirds mr squared times omega. Now the other thing is omega... All right, so V, I'll, I'll go over here. V tangential equals R omega. In other words, omega equals V tangential over R, or just V over R. All right, we usually drop this T there. So I'm going to plug that in for the omega down here. Instead of putting in omega, I'm going to put V over R. That's a V over R squared. That bottom thing is an R there, equals MGH. So interestingly enough, if you look at this math here in the middle where you have that rotational expression, and I'm running out of space here. I should give myself more space. One half MV squared plus, now if you look at this, I'm going to start multiplying. These are multiplying. It's not distributive property. One half times two thirds is one-third. So I'm going to get one-third mr squared. Then I'm going to square the v, and so I'm going to get v squared over r squared when I square this uh, um, expression here. I square both of the terms inside there, both of the factors inside there, mgh. And what's going to happen here, if you look at this, that actually this R, this R right here is really the same R. I'm going to make a capital R. It's the same R. It's referring to the radius of the ball. So I'm not magically making that the radius of the ball. It is the radius of the ball, capital R. So what that means is, if you look at this, the R's will cancel. This R squared, because you're multiplying, one's in the denominator, one's in the numerator, those will cancel. So I'm going to go to the right here and rewrite everything. So what I have now, because I can't go down much further. I don't like going across the page, but I'll, I have to go across the page here. So now that whole thing becomes, so this whole thing, all of this, I'm going to take it and write it up here. I'm simplifying it. It's going to be 1 half mv squared plus, it's going to be 1 third mv squared. equals mgh. So things have gotten much simpler all, all of a sudden. And once again, if you're looking at this mathematically and, and from an algebra standpoint, you got to be careful about canceling stuff, but if you have, there's two terms on the left, things that are separated by the plus sign, and one term on the right, but because they all have an m in them, they all have an m in them, okay? Mathematicians, 
physicists, physics teachers really like this because the M's cancel. That's why the mass of the ball doesn't matter. If we had the mass of the ball, we could have plugged it in. But because all three of those have an M in them, you can cancel them. So, once you've done that, now the problem becomes even simpler. Mathematically speaking, you got one half V squared plus one third V squared equals GH. And you could take one half plus one third, which is what, uh, three, uh, three sixths and two sixths would give you five sixths if you want to do it that way. Or you can just plug the numbers in now. In other words, I know V. I, I know everything but H. It's one half. And what was the velocity here of this ball? It was eight point something? 8.45. So now I can actually plug the numbers in. You could do a little bit more algebra before this, but 8.45 squared plus one third times 8.45 squared equals 9.8. If you want to use 10, that's okay. But I, you know, in this case, I'm going to use 9.8 times h. We know everything but h. If you do the math here, it's 35.7, 35.7 plus 23.8, I hope. Hopefully all these numbers are correct. Equals 9.8 H. Add to 35 and 23, which is like 58, 59.5. 59.5 divided by 9.8, H equals 6.1 meters. H equals 6.1 meters. That's how high the ball will go. Its center of mass will elevate that much off the ground. The bottom of the ball basically goes that high off the ground from where it was when it was on the level ground. All right, conservation of energy. Energy is transferred from rotational and, and translational kinetic energy into GPE. Now, I'm going to erase a few things. So once again, you might want to pause this because I'm going to do part B. Part B does not give you the same answer. I've already given you a few clues on that, but let me erase a few things here. Sorry, I basically erased everything. So starting over. Part B, I wrote down the law of conservation of energy. You start with your initial energy plus energy in. Oh, that should have said minus. That should have been minus right here. Uh, minus the energy out equals zero. I mean, it's going to be zero anyways, but minus the energy out equals zero. Uh, e equals the energy final. Now, as we said before, this has two parts. It has the E um, linear. It has the E linear plus the E rotational equals the energy final, which will be the GPE. But here's the weird thing, and I'll explain this, plus E rotational, which is, kinetic. these are all kinetic energy. I, I could have put the KE. That's KE, KE, KE. Those are all KEs. KE linear, KE rotational, because here's what's going to happen. If there's no friction, if there's no friction, and it says that, it's, it's implied in this, as it rolls along, it's a slippery hill. And if something's really slippery, the ball just keeps spinning, 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 and it takes friction to actually stop the ball from spinning. Another, what you're going to find out here is that friction actually helps the ball get a little higher in, on the hill. It's not going to go as high this time. Because when it gets to that high spot, this, this is, I'm going to call it H sub 2 in this case, because now we're doing part two or part B, it's going to go to a different height than it did before in part A. And it's not going to be as high because when the ball gets there and it stops going up the hill, it'll still just be spinning. It has all its kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy. It's no longer going linearly. So that's what's really weird about that. That's a, that's a weird aspect. What, what that means is it's a simpler problem. That means that this, well, they're not zero. They're not zero. So I don't want to say they're zero, because that usually means that's zero. They cancel out, because they're the same thing on both sides of the equation. They cancel out of the problem. It's, just, it's going to be the same rotation at the beginning as it is at the end. So it cancels out of the problem. It's not zero, though. It's some number. Well, whatever the number was before, I think it was uh, 23.8. It's going to be 23.8 on both sides. The bottom line is you're going to have Ke initial or linear initial equals the GPE. Well, we did it before. It's going to be 1 half mv squared equals um, mgh. 
and the M's will cancel out again. M G H. So the M's cancel out. So it's just one half v squared. What is eight point four five? equals 9.8 times h. So you just do the math there and h comes out to be 3.6 meters. Doesn't go as high. Because the, the ball still has, it's, it's still spinning, it still has its kinetic energy, which like I said was 23.8 joules of spinning rotational kinetic energy, which it's the same when it starts and ends, so it just cancels out the problem. That's a, it's an interesting thought there. All right, now we have what's called Atwood, an Atwood machine. You're going to be doing a lab on this, I believe. An Atwood machine is a pulley with two masses. If one mass is bigger than the other, the big mass will go down, the more mass. In this case, mass one is bigger. We're saying mass one is bigger. Um, so... Uh, I'm just by the way, their label. I'm just going to call the big mass, mass one, is 50, 10, 10, 10 kilograms. So I'm just going to call that one 10 kilograms, 10.0 kilograms, and the other one 5.0. It really wouldn't matter because this, the small one can be more dense. It could be the heavier one, but I'll just say this. M sub 2 is 5 kilograms. All right. Now, what kind of a problem is this? Is it angular momentum? Is it rotational inertia. There's a lot of things going on here. This basically is a Newton's second law torque net or F net. Equal, F net equals MA for the two masses and torque net equals I alpha for the spinning pulley. And you'll have to do some math like this in the lab. Except I think it might be a little bit easier in the lab because you're going to assume no friction. This one has friction. So I'll show you how this. It tells you it has a frictional torque there's friction in the bearing in the middle of this pulley. We have a string that goes over. And one of the things I've said before when we did these string problems, uh, if there's a string that goes over a pulley in a perfect world with no friction, whatever the tension is, if it's 40 newtons, it's 40 newtons tension everywhere in that string at all points. But when there's friction, the tension in the string can be a little bit different. If there's more friction, there's going to be a lot of difference. But here there's a small amount of friction. So the tension in the string here is a little bit different than over there. It's real close. You'll find that out that they're, they're very close. But you can't assume they're exactly the same. It could be 42 and 40. They might be slightly different. The less friction there is, the more equal they are. If there's no friction, they have equal tensions if you have a single string. Come back to that thought. But it does says there's, it says there's friction here. All right, but Atwood machine, okay, is basically you're going to be using Newton's second law for the two masses, and then we're going to use Newton's second law for the, the pulley itself, which you may or may not have to do in the, in the lab, um, depending on how much friction or how much rotational inertia is in the pulley that you're using. But bottom line is, I'm going to do F net. 1 equals mass 1 times A1. But I'm not going to call it A1 because the acceleration of both masses will be the same. Except for one will be going down, one will be going up because they're, they're, they're tied to a string. So they're going to have the same acceleration. So I don't need to label those 1 and 2. But F net will be different for each. The diff different masses are different masses. So I have to label them as M1 and M2. But I don't need to label the acceleration as 1 and 2 because it's the same acceleration for both. So I'm going to be doing that. And that's probably all you'll be doing in the lab. Uh, what I forgot to do, which shame on me, all right, so one of the things you should, you should do first, well, I realized that after I started writing down F net equals MA, is you need to look at your free body diagrams for each mass and for the pulley. For example, on the left over here, this is the 10 kilogram mass. And we're going to assume these are all three sig figs numbers, even though you know there's so many zeros here. But let's just do this all the three sig figs, and then we'll round off the two sig figs at the end. But here's a 10 kilogram mass. There's two forces. If it's hanging by a string, 100 newtons down. That's the down, that's the weight. Always put that on the diagram first. And then the tension force in that string, that's the string right here holding that mass up. So here's the free body force diagram for mass one. 
I don't know the string tension yet. Here's the free body force diagram for mass 2. I know it's 50 newtons. We'll call that 2 sig figs. And then the tension number 2. Now in a perfect world, T1 and T2 are the same as each other. But like I say, with friction, they're not going to be exactly the same as each other. The other thing is you really need a free body torque diagram. Free body torque diagram for the pulley. All right. So what's creating torque on the pulley? Now I've labeled, la laid it out. This is kind of the first time we've gone through this in detail for a pulley. So there's this tension right here, T1, is the same as the tension in... So the string on this side of the pulley does have the same tension everywhere. If it's 40 newtons, it's 40 newtons everywhere. It's that it's not the same as the string like it normally would be on the other side. With no friction, it'd also be 40 newtons, but it could be 42 over here. But it's still 42 everywhere. So if this tension is 42, then... Oh, I just I mislabeled this. This is a T2 over here. T sub... Oops, this is T sub 2. All right. So... Um, so I have my torque diagram, and this blue arrow, this blue circle over here, which I can't see right now, okay, all right, let me get this out of here, the blue circle, uh, blue arrow, is the counter torque, it's a, it tells me the problem, there's a counter frictional torque of 0.25, so that represents torque that's trying to slow this thing down, because I know the big mass is trying to make it go in the direction of the red arrow I have here. It's trying to make this thing go counterclockwise, but the frictional torque is trying to make it go counterclockwise, uh, or slow down, at least. All right? T1 is creating a torque, torque created by a force. The torque is, torque by a particular force is R cross F sine. So it's RF sine theta. And the sine of theta will be 90. So it'll be RF sine 90, once again, you don't need to put down the sine 90, it'll be sine of 90 is 1. But in other words, this rope right here is trying to make the whole thing turn counterclockwise. Because of the torque, it's a force, torque, uh, tension, times the radius, which is the R. The radius here, the radius is the lever arm. It tells you it's 50, well, 28 centimeters is the radius, 0.28 meters. That's given up here in a problem. So, Rope number one is trying to make the thing go counterclockwise by exerting a force at a distance, a torque. And number two is a counterproductive uh, torque. Countering that one, it's actually working with friction to try to slow this thing down. T1 is trying to make it speed up. It's the big weight because of the big weight. And T2 is the smaller weight and the friction, which I'll, I'll incorporate here in a second. But let's go back to, so there's three equations we're going to deal with. F, so we're going back to mass 1. And you'll need to do this. I think you'll have to do this for sure in the lab, this diagram here. Two separate free body diagrams. F net equals MA. So once again, if M1 is big, it's going to go down. Okay, I know that the F net, the acceleration will be down. So it's going to be 100, which is the down force, minus the up force, T1, equals M1, which is 10. It's got a mass of 10, times A. So there's two unknowns there, T1 and A. So it's F net is big force minus small force. That takes care of all negatives here in this problem, like we've talked about before. So, so T1 is less than 100, because I know this big one is going to go down. It's bigger than the 5. All right. So now I'm going to apply F net equals MA to the small mass. In that one, the up force is bigger, because I know that's going to go up. So it's going to be T2 minus 50 equals 5, you could say 5.0a. I have three unknowns though so far. Well, two unknowns in this equation, t2 and a. Two unknowns over here, but it's the same a. So totally I have three unknowns right now, t1, a, and t2. The rule in algebra is if I have three unknowns, I need three equations to solve for everything. I need another equation. So those two equations are important there. I'm going to circle those because I'm going to use those in a minute here, or in a couple minutes. So now what I'm going to do is torque net. Torque net equals I alpha. That's the rotational analogy to F net equals MA. There are three torques here, however, that have to be combined to get torque net. So we have three things 
you can take the big torque minus the small torque. And there's two small torques here that have to be subtracted. The big torque is going to be the one because of tension number, string number one. It's going to be that tension. It's going to be T1 times its distance. Torque is four. So what I'm doing is I'm doing R times F, okay, or F times R. F is T1, and the force is, the distance is 0.28 meters. So that string is that force times that distance times the sine of 90, so I'm not going to write that. But I have to subtract the other two torques. I'm going to subtract the torque that's working against that to make clockwise torque times, it's still the same distance, 0.28. So this string is pulling to try to make it accelerate. Torque is force times distance minus the other torque, minus the frictional torque, which is given as already 0.25, equals I alpha. It tells me I in the problem. The, mom the moment of inertia of the pulley is 0 0.038, and the units are good, 0 0.038 kilo, yeah. So that's 0 0.038, that's my I, 0 0.038, I'm getting tight here, times alpha. Oh, I don't know alpha. So I just have to use the symbol for that right now. It doesn't tell me what alpha is. So now I got another problem or another variable here. All right, that equation has T1 and T2 and alpha. So now I have a new variable. So now I have four variables total. If I look at that equation I just wrote in the first one, it has three variables. I got four variables. So now I need another equation. Oh boy, but don't despair, all right? I also know, and I'll do this in blue so we can see it. Um, here's the connection, all right? I know that linear to rotational, that A, linear acceleration is R times rotational acceleration. That's in the first page of notes. Or in other words, if I solve that for alpha, I get alpha equals a over R. In other words, I'm going to plug that in. I'm going to plug that in way over here for alpha. I'm going to rewrite all of this and I'm going to start, well, actually I can't do a whole lot of simplifying. Let me pause and write down what I have here. So this big circle I have over here is what I just did and I rearranged things to make it look a little cleaner maybe. T sub 1 times 0.28 is the same as 0.28 times T sub 1 so that just looks a little bit better. Put the numerical coefficient in front of the variable. Minus 0.28 is t sub 2 minus the 0.25 equals 0 0.038. And I put in a over r, as I did in the blue up here. The blue here is that the I'm getting rid of alpha, the rotational acceleration, and substituting a over r. But I know the value for r in this problem. The radius of this pulley is 0.28. That's what I put in there. So this 0.28 is the r value, the radius. So now I have an equation here with three variables, the same three variables I have over here. So I have three equations with the same three variables. The rest is just messy algebra, if it wasn't messy enough already. So again, in the lab, you may not have to do this part over here. You'll be doing this part over here, where T1 and T2 are the same, I hope. But if not, you'll have to do this whole thing like this. So it's going to be this the same format in the lab if you have friction. So beware of that. I'm not sure there'll be friction in the lab or not. But now it's algebra. So I'm going to pause and do some of the algebra. So hang on. So I did two steps here. And it looks like we'll get messier before it gets cleaner, but we're getting close to being clean here. In other words, what I did is I took this big equation and I took the 0 0.038 and divided by 0 0.28 and got 0.136a. So I, this, this right here is just a simplification of the circle above it. Then I came over here with this Newton's second law for the masses and solved each one for t. For another example here, t sub 1, if you move things around, is going to be 100 minus 10a. And t sub 2 is 5a plus 50. So I took those expressions and plugged them in. So I took the 5a plus 50 and brought it over here for t sub 1 which comes down over here. I put it in parentheses here. I brought down the 0.28.
and then the T sub 1 is 100 minus 10A. I brought it over here to T1, plugged it in. It comes down here in parentheses as 100 minus 10A with the 0.28. What I'm going to do now is use the distributor property, and then things start to get easier after that, because what you will notice here, hopefully, is that now I have an equation with one variable. All it has is A, and there's no squares. So it comes out, the algebra now is not that hard at this point. What's hard is putting all this together. There's a lot of steps here, and it looks cumbersome once again. It's one of these things, if you have it on your paper, it makes you look like a genius if you have this written down. I'm not putting myself as a genius, all right? But it, when people see this, it's like, what is going on here? But it's at this point, it's, it's, it's basic, straightforward algebra. So I'll do a couple steps here and pause. Hooray, I finished it. I used distributive property here, 28. So 100 times 0.28 is 28. Minus 10 times 0.28 is 2.8a. Minus then multiplying 5 times 0.28 is 1.4a. Minus 14, when I continue with the distributive property, minus the 0.25, which I just brought down, equals 0.136a. Now I start combining like terms, and it falls into place very quickly, and you feel really good. Hopefully, I do. Um, hopefully, you do as well. The it says 28 minus 14 is 14, minus 0.25 is 13.75. I'm going to play a little bit loose with sig figs here. I'm going to go to four sig figs, but at the end, go back to two sig figs. And then 2.8, negative 2.8 minus 1.4 is negative 4.2. Then I add the 4.2 to both sides, and I get 4.336a. Combine those two like terms as I move it across and add. And then divide by 4.336, and I get 3.2 meters per second squared is what they wanted us to do. Find the acceleration. The big mass accelerates down with that rate, and the small mass accelerates up with that rate. Congratulations. Wow. And for fun, you know, this is fun for me, maybe not for you, but for fun, you could figure out T sub 1 and T sub 2, like over here. T sub 1 is going to be 100 minus 10 times 3.2. So T sub 1 equals 100 minus 32, which is what, 68, uh, 68 newtons. That's T sub 1. And T sub 2 was going to be 5 times 3.2. So it's 5 times 3.2 plus 50. All right, so hopefully you can read that. 5 times 3.2 is 15 point, uh, was it 15 point 1? Okay. Uh, no, it's 16. It's 16. Sorry, 16. 16 plus 50 is 66 newtons. So you can see T1 and T2 are real close together. They're almost, because there's not much friction here, if there's no friction, they'd both be like probably 67. But they're close. And they were almost close enough we could almost assume. We could have, if we assumed they would equal, you would have gotten a very close answer to what we got. Uh, but if there's a lot of friction, there'll be a greater difference. Okay, congratulations on that one. One more here. One more. Another, oh, wow, it looks, this one's not as long as that one. All right, but we have an astronaut working out in space. They're tethered to the space station by a rope, a tether, to the nose of the space station. They better be tethered on because if they're not tethered on and they don't have any means of propulsion, maybe you saw this in the movie, I think it was in Gravity with Sandra Bullock, I can't remember now. If you get outside and you get pushed away, you start to float away, once you get in motion, you stay in motion, and you, keep, you can't get back if you're not tied on. So she's tied on. But there's a loose hose on the back and uh, it gives a little tangential thrust with an acceleration. So there's a lot of review stuff here. All right. Um, we have to get her tangential speed, part A. So sometimes you got to read the question to figure out where to get started. This is a basically uh, a kinematics. Well, it's a kinematics. It's a torque problem. But it starts off with a... Um, Rotational kinematics, omega zero, basically part A. Start off with that, see if it works. Omega zero, she's not spinning, okay? Um, and then you have your omega final. It tells you what your, your acceleration is, your tangential acceleration, but we want to figure out alpha. But alpha will be r times a tangential. We'll come back to that. And we have a time. And I think that's all we need to know for now. 
For example here, it says that the time is two minutes. The time is 120 seconds, if you read the whole thing. She's starting off with a zero uh, radians per second. Because it's asking you for the final rotational speed. Actually, the tangential speed. We've got to get the rotational speed, and then we'll, we'll convert that to tangential speed after she discovers and fixes the leak. And we have alpha. Actually, they tell you alpha. Well, they tell you that A tangential is 1.1 times 10 to the negative third times G, which is 9.8. That's in the information up here, right here. This little G right here means 9.8. So my tangential velocity to start, or my tangential acceleration here, is 1.1 times 10 to the negative third times 9.8. Hopefully I'm doing this number right. It's 0 0.0108 um, meters per second squared. Yeah, and I did that. I did that right. But I need to get alpha. I, I know that a a tangential equals r alpha. So in other words, alpha equals a tangential over r. So in this case. A tangential is 0 0.0108, and those units were correct, meters per second squared, divided by the radius, and it says she's at a radius of 118 meters. 118 meters. So, 118 meters, that's, we want meters. So her t um, rotational acceleration is 9.2 times 10 to the negative fifth, 9.2 times 10 to the negative fifth, radians per second squared. All right, linear acceleration is meters per second squared. Tangential is radians per second squared. So we bring that over to the left here. This is 9.2 times 10 to the negative fifth radians per second squared. Now we have our kinematics conditions. We want to figure out omega f. Well, the third equation if you look back at our kinematics equations, omega f equals omega i plus alpha t. I don't expect you to memorize those equations. I'm sorry, we call it omega zero. Omega zero. All right, so omega f we're looking for. Omega f equals zero. That's a zero. Plus 9.2 times 10 to the negative fifth times our t of 120. So omega f, her final rotational speed here is 0 0.011 radians per second. 0 0.011 radians per second. But I want the tangential velocity right there. And once again, v tangential here in the middle is r times omega. So my tangential velocity here is my radius, which is what, 118? The 118 times that 0 0.011 radians per second. So my tangential or her tangential velocity here comes out to be, uh, I believe that's 1.3 meters per second, which doesn't seem very fast. I believe that's correct though. And that is correct. Uh, now, believe it or not, the rest of this is actually not that bad. Part B, especially, it's just straightforward. It says calculate her current angular momentum. Well, if we have her, uh, well, it's just this is a plug-in. Uh, it's just part B. The equation for angular momentum is L equals I omega. So I think it tells you. Well, it doesn't tell you. The I value, her, mo uh, her moment of inertia. But here's the thing. Here's where the problem solving comes in. If she's at the, long, the end of a long rope, she's like a, a point mass. She's like a, you can make her like one spot her center of gravity. In other words, her rotational inertia on a long rope relative to her size is just mR squared. She's a point mass at the end of a long rope. So it's just going to be mR squared. I could, I could, 
plug, I could do a separate calculation. It tells me that her total mass is what here? 154. So I didn't need that for part A. But 154 times 118 meters squared, that's a lot of uh, rotational inertia, comes out to be uh, 2.1 times 10 to the 6th, 2.1 times 10 to the 6th kilograms meters squared. So I go back over here to the left. That's my 2.1. Wow, that's like 2,100,000 2, times 10 to the 6th proper units times her omega in rotational units. What was it? 0 .011? Yeah, it was 0 .011. Double check that. 0.011. So her current angular momentum, all right, is 23,000 kilograms meters squared per second. Those are the proper units. Again, you can throw radians in there, you don't have to. All right, that's her current angular momentum. Now, since we're dealing with angular momentum, almost always if you have an angular momentum problem, it's probably going to be dealing with conservation of angular momentum. That comes into play here in part C. Not always, but it's very likely. And that's what his part C says. She pulls herself in because she wants to get back to the spaceship, but she's already kind of spinning in a, in a circle. But as she pulls herself in, angular momentum is conserved. So the scenario or the technique for this is you always line up like this. L1, that's where she is at the end of the rope, equals L2. Her angular momentum at the end, way out there at 118 meters, is equal to her angular momentum when she gets closer. It says angular momentum, once again, if I circle this over here, is I times omega. It's going to be I sub 1 at the end of that rope times omega sub 1 at the end of that rope equals her new rotational inertia times omega 2, her new speed when she's closer in. Now, once again, it's the analogy is once you tuck yourself in, you go, you spin faster. Now she's pulling herself in, so now her mass is all getting closer. We have to recalculate this middle calculation here. It's the same calculation except for now the radius is going to be five. I'm going to repeat this calculation here in the middle. It's now going to be her mass 154. She's still the same mass, but now she's going to be five meters. She's going to get herself so she's five meters away from the spaceship. She keeps pulling herself in, she gets closer and closer, because she get, she's got to get back into the spaceship. So it's 154 times 5 squared at that position. So now her rotational inertia is 3,900 kilograms meters squared. All right, so that's her new rotational inertia, which is important. That's, that's I sub 2. So I sub 1, her rotational inertia when she's far out, relative to that distance is a large number, but now her rotational inertia is smaller because her, her distance is much closer to the, the rotational point, the nose cone of the of the spaceship, the space station. So now I just plug in over here to the right. I sub 1 is 2.1 times 10 to the 6th times her initial omega in radians per second, which was 0 0.011. There's a shortcut you could have taken, but we're not going to take the shortcut now. Equals, it's really not that much of a shortcut, times omega 2. So her second rotational inertia, which has changed because she's closer in. You do the math there, you get omega sub 2 equals 5.9. Omega sub 2 equals 5.9 the radians per second, which doesn't seem like a big number, but actually it's a pretty big number. Uh, if you convert that into RPMs, if you convert convert that to R RPMs, uh, it's like, oh, um, so you, mul you multiply by what, 16 divided by 2 pi? So it's, you know, 5.9 times 60 divided by 2 pi. It's like 56 RPMs. That's a lot of RPMs. Uh, so we, you didn't need to do that there. Just had I think it just said get it into let's just find her tangential. Oh, tangential speed. We got to get the tangential speed. Well, tangential speed is r times omega. So her tangential speed right now is her current radius of five 
times the proper units, 5.9 radians per second. So her tangential speed right now is 30 meters per second. It comes out exactly 30. That's like 60 miles per hour. Just over that, I think. She's really going fast. I mean, and, and what's going to happen is she's, she's not going to be able to maintain her grip. And you can see that in part D here. As her rotational speed is very fast, her tangential speed is very fast. She'll get dizzy or she won't be able to hold on. Well, let's see here. Part D. Figure out the centripetal force necessary. This is a good review question. The centripetal force necessary, and you can look this up, the equation for centripetal force is mv squared over r. The centripetal force necessary to maintain this would be her mass, 154, times the tangential speed. You want that in the linear tangential speed squared over the 5 meters, because that's how far she is right now. So the centripetal force necessary for her to hold on, for the rope to have that tension, is 28,000 newtons. 28,000 newtons. All right, that's about, that's roughly 6,000 pounds of force. She won't be able to hold on. Nobody can hold on to that much. She, she'll fall off before she even gets there. So she's in a predicament. She's got to slow herself down before she pulls herself in. She's got to have, and she probably has some uh, jet pack on her, on her back to do the reverse process of what sped her up in the first place and slow herself down before she pulls herself in. Otherwise, she won't be able to come back in. All right, so that's the final problem in Unit 10, Rotational Kinematics. We'll practice this with some homework and in class. In class.